So, um, welcome to tonight's presentation, hosted by the Washington, D.C. chapter of the ASA, the American Scientific Affiliation. Uh, my name is Mike Beidler, President of the Washington, D.C. chapter, and uh, I currently serve as a Senior Analyst for the Department of Defense's Joint Capability Technology Demonstration Office, which manages a sizable portfolio of rapid prototype projects using mature technologies to create innovative solutions for current and future problems that uh, the U.S. and allied militaries face. Uh, it's a brand new job. This is uh, week number two. So I'm uh, pretty happy to get started on some pretty exciting stuff with some uh, cutting-edge researchers and engineers. Um, uh, with me are the chapter's other two officers, uh, Vice President Cy Gart. Cy, if you could wave your hand there and uh, say something so your little box pop uh, lights up. Hello. Glad everyone's here. We have a lot of regular members with us, which is great. Yep. And we've got uh, our secretary, Keith Furman. Keith? Great to see everybody. All right. And we're pleased to have uh, here with us tonight, uh, Dr. Mike Summers from George Mason University. He will be our guest presenter. Now, firstly, I want to thank everyone uh, choosing to be with us over binging Netflix. And I'm glad you're joining us for this conversation. Uh, secondly, we hope that everyone out there is faring well amidst the current health crisis. And we pray that you're finding creative ways to stay connected and build community like this. And uh, I also hope that you're finding opportunities to safely support the most vulnerable among us. And I'd like to uh, introduce the, the meeting format. <clears throat> Uh, and before we get started, I'm going to mute everybody. And I'm going to, I think I am, can you guys hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. And now I'd like to delve into the meeting format a little bit. Uh, Dr. Summers is going to give his presentation, which will take about an hour, followed by approximately 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so now, since this is a Zoom meeting and not a webinar, the Q&A button is not available. So we're going to allow Dr. Summers to complete his entire presentation before taking questions. Now, if you have a question during the presentation, please make note of that question. And uh, alternatively, you can uh, pose that. Actually, we would prefer that you pose that question in the chat box. As your cursor uh, you hover it over the screen, you'll see the chat box down there. And uh, pose your question there. Please make sure that you type capital letters question, colon, and then your question. And what I will do is I will curate from that list of questions uh, for the Q&A afterwards. <clears throat> As with any event, uh, we ask that uh, everyone be respectful and charitable. Uh, at the end of the Q&A, I'll end the formal portion of the meeting, but we'll leave the Zoom session open for about 30 minutes of post-meeting networking. And I can create uh, some uh, uh, breakout rooms if anyone would like to, to uh, separate into particular rooms. But uh, I think uh, we've got a small enough group tonight that uh, we could probably just uh, stay in this main room. And um, <clears throat> just for those of you who are not familiar with the ASA, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I'm going to give a little spiel about what the ASA is. And give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Okay, so... Uh, tonight, we're being hosted not from Washington, D.C., but from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I just moved my daughter uh, down here for her junior year of college. Uh, we moved her out of her apartment, her roach-infested apartment, I might add, into a much cleaner house. So she is going to be happy for the next couple of years. Now, what is the ASA? Uh, the ASA was founded in 1941 as an international network of Christians in the sciences. And as scientists, uh, the members of the ASA take part in humanity's exploration of nature and its laws. Now, as Christians, uh, we are curious to know not just how the universe came into being and operates, but why it exists in the first place. And so 
uh, one of our oops one of our uh, f- you know foundational uh, beliefs is that uh, God is uh, both creator of our vast universe and the source of our ability to pursue knowledge and that's because he created a universe that is orderly and understandable uh, also that the honest and open studies of both scripture and nature are mutually beneficial uh, and once we uh, you know get a more holistic uh, understanding of, of those two things uh, we have a better idea of who we are as human beings and the environment around us in which we find ourselves. So what do we believe? Uh, we believe in the divine inspiration, trustworthiness, and authority of the Bible in matters of faith and conduct. We also confess the triune God, affirmed in the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed, which we accept as brief, faithful statements of Christian doctrine based on the Bible. And we believe that God, in creating and preserving the universe, has endowed it, endowed it with order, it's intelligible, it's rational. And because it is those things, uh, we are able to investigate using the scientific method. Also, as uh, members of this planet, uh, we have a responsibility. We are stewards. God has given us uh, his creation to care for using everything at our disposal, our, our brains, our science, our technology, not just for our own good as a species, but for the rest of the world. Uh, We meet uh, typically here in the Washington DC area uh, quarterly. We have three uh, major meetings per year uh, with special presentators and also a fall potluck social. Uh, Typically we meet at the National Presbyterian Church in Washington DC. However, that was all kind of pre-COVID-19. Uh, we've had to kind of readjust the way we've been doing business and now we are safely meeting for the first time. This is the inaugural Zoom event uh, for the Washington DC chapter. Now our next meeting would typically be sometime post Labor Day in the fall uh, at my house. Uh, We've been doing this for probably what Sai for the past uh, four or five years uh, for that fall potluck social, uh, plenty of fi- science and faith discussion, uh, but it gives us an opportunity to uh, just kind of let our hair down, not have the, the, the big presentations, get to know each other as people and as fellow uh, believers in Christ. And, but t- really anyone can attend. Uh, we've got local ASA members uh, in the DC area and then anyone else who's interested in the intersection of science and faith. So, um, you know, we're, we're still just kind of catching up to this whole Zoom thing, and uh, we don't have anything planned out for the fall yet uh, or the winter, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, make those announcements here in the coming months as to our next meeting. Now, we have an annual meeting, and this year's annual meeting was unfortunately canceled uh, due to the COVID-19 health crisis. Um, So the ASA Executive Council has decided to shift uh, everything to the right by one year. Uh, They are still trying to work out the details with Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, but the tentative dates for that annual meeting is July 30th through the 2nd of August. That's a Friday through a Monday. And the theme uh, uh, next year, which would have been the theme this year, is Exploring Creation. And as you can see on the screen, we've got uh, confirmed plenary speakers. And uh, one of those uh, plenary speakers is uh, Jack Collins. And uh, Jack uh, has received uh, grants from the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, He has also received grants from the Center for Science and Culture for his work in science and faith. He's written a number of books. One of them uh, titled, uh, Did Adam and Eve Really Exist? Who Were They and Why Should You Care? Um, He's also written a commentary on Genesis 1 through 4. And he also served as the Old Testament chair on the translation committee for the ESV, the English Standard Version. So he's a top-notch guy. Uh, We've got uh, Professor Alistair McGrath. I'm sure you guys have heard of him. Um, He's over there in Oxford. Uh, We've got Dr. Lydia Yeager. Holds a permanent lectureship and academic dean at Nogent Bible Institute in uh, Nogent-sur-Marne in France. 
Um, we've got uh, Dr. David Livingston uh, from Northern Ireland. Uh, let's see, he's got, uh, he's interested in uh, a lot of related themes, uh, the histories of geographical knowledge, the spatiality of scientific culture, historical geographies of science and religion, uh, and done uh, some focuses on uh, the geographies of Darwinism. Uh, Hans uh, Madume, they're from uh, Covenant College in Georgia. Uh, after he completed a residency in internal medicine, he began asking questions about uh, the interface of science and theology and how they relate and what the role of scripture is. And then uh, last but not least, we got uh, Dr. Uh, Christina Lake, uh, who has written a book called The Prophets of the Post-Human. And that provides a fresh and original reading on fictional narratives that raise the question of what it means to be human in the face of rapidly developing bio-enhancement technologies. So, I mean, this is, this is a pretty powerful uh, set of plenary speakers. And we're hoping to do this in person next year. Uh, we're not entirely sure if that's going to happen. It really is going to depend on how things play out in terms of uh, the vaccine development. And we wish uh, uh, Francis Collins and uh, Anthony Fauci uh, the best of success. And we pray for them uh, constantly that uh, their uh, wisdom would guide uh, their efforts in developing a vaccine that will help uh, get not just our country, but the entire world back on its feet again. Uh, so we, this big, uh, these plenary speakers here at the 75th annual uh, meeting, uh, there are also some field trips that are involved in the day or day and a half prior on that Thursday and Friday. And as an example of what they do uh, in Chicago last year, uh, they toured Fermilab, uh, did some, uh, some cultural uh, sites such as a, a, a boat tour of Chicago, uh, a geology tour uh, with the ASA president, uh, Steve Mosher, uh, and, uh, and the Morton Arboretum. And right there, you can see on the screen uh, the cost of the event. And this is uh, from last year. And uh, the good thing is that if you can get in early enough there is a night owl discount, and that is going to save you a lot of money. So put those dates on your calendar, and as soon as that announcement is put out, just snag your, your reservation, snag those tickets, and you'll be able to save uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, if you know any student members, it's free. We've got scholarships that are uh, able uh, allow them to be able to, uh, to join us for that. Uh, so, that, you know, they'll have to provide the transportation, but uh, being there for the annual meeting is free. <clears throat> now, our organization also presents uh, a quarterly, or publishes a quarterly uh, journal called Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. This is a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, both print and electronic is available. And as you can see on the screen, our June 2020 issue is on transhumanism. Now, in an ideal world, uh, one of our plenary speakers this year wrote about transhumanism. And this uh, particular journal issue would have uh, fit in very, very nicely uh, with her presentation. Uh, the ASA also has one other publication, God and Nature magazine. And there we have our co-editors, uh, Sai and his wife, Aniko. And uh, you, might, you might recognize the, the gentleman in the middle. Francis Collins has nothing to do with a magazine, but I thought it was a great picture. So I wanted to throw that out there. And uh, they just released their 20, uh, summer 2020 uh, issue on the COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to encourage you to go to that URL at the top of the screen and check that out. And uh, Sai, if you want to uh, say something about, you know, what they might find in this magazine, uh, I'll, I'll give you a minute there. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. I, I'm not going to take a lot of time. The, generally, the magazine uh, publishes essays of various topics related to science and faith. We also publish poetry, uh, photo essays. Tom J. Ord has used uh, has been giving uh, do, doing a photo essay column, beautiful photographs. We have a few other people doing that, 
And uh, any topic in science and faith is of interest. We don't have special issues usually, but we were asked to do a special issue this summer on COVID-19. And you'll find, in fact, one of our members, Paul Arbison, I don't think he's here with us yet, but uh, he has a, an article, a short uh, article in this issue. There are, I think, something like 15 different articles all about COVID-19 from various angles, including uh, a clinical perspective, research perspectives, how there's one uh, photo essay about, uh, which I think Mike would like, uh, will like, which is about uh, cooking from a Star Wars uh, recipe book with kids. So, you know, what do you do with kids? And one answer is cook with them. So there's, there's it's interesting. Take a look. And uh, if mainly what I'd like to say is if anyone here is interested in submitting something, please don't hesitate. Uh, essays are usually around anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 words. If you have a poem uh, or a photograph or something, artwork, whatever, send it in. If you look at the, the link, you'll see a, a submit page. And that's, I think that's all I'll say. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. All right. So if, if anyone out there is not a member of the ASA and uh, what you hear tonight and see tonight uh, is of interest to you and you would like to join the organization, I would encourage you to pursue a full membership. Uh, and that is available to anyone with uh, at least a bachelor's degree in the sciences. And that is science interpreted broadly. Uh, it could be uh, any of the social sciences as well. And uh, you can go online to our website, asa3.org, and take a look at our statement of faith. And if you can give assent to that, and it's a very simple statement of faith, I just showed that to you earlier in the presentation, um, it should be a no-brainer. And we also welcome philosophers and theologians who are interested in the intersection of science and faith. And as a full member, you've got voting privileges, you can hold office. And if you're a retiree, we're going to reduce those uh, member dues to $45 a year. If you are a non-scientist, uh, you can become an associate member, and the only difference is that you won't have any voting or office privileges, but we would love you to become a part of our family, and this really is a great place uh, to converse about uh, the intersection of science and faith. And the great thing about a student membership, if you know any students, it's free. And if they want to print a copy of the journal, uh, that's just going to cost $20 a year. And again, as I mentioned before, free registration for that annual meeting. So this is a, you want to get those students uh, really, really plugged in. And I think uh, uh, some of you have been on the, the previous weeks, uh, ASA uh, plenary events that have kind of, uh, we're doing in place of uh, the annual meeting this year. And we did have some students join us. For that and so we were excited to, to see them uh, come in and they're really excited about what we're doing. So uh, without further ado I do want to introduce to you uh, Mike Summers uh, tonight and um, let me tell you a little bit about Mike. Uh, Mike and I actually go to the same church, uh, Fairfax Community Church in Fairfax, Virginia. And that's how I met Mike, and uh, just a wonderful guy. He's a professor of uh, planetary science and astronomy at George Mason University. And as a planetary scientist who specializes in the study of structure and evolution of planetary atmospheres, his research has dealt with the chemistry and thermal structure of the atmospheres of Io. Uh, that's one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Titan, that's the largest of Saturn's moons. Uh, Uranus, Neptune, Triton, that's the largest Neptunian moon and Pluto, as well as Mars. Uh, he's also done research on our own atmosphere, and that's been focused on understanding middle atmospheric ozone chemistry, uh, coupled chemical dynamical radiative modeling of uh, active trace gases, and heterogeneous chemistry on meteor dust, and a whole host of other things that are really over my head. But he's also worked on NASA space missions that study the Earth from the space shuttle and orbiting satellites, and also uh, deep space robotic missions. And one of the things he presented about three years ago, I want to say, was uh, the New Horizons mission to Pluto in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, just some amazing stuff. 
And I think some of you uh, were there at Fairfax Community Church uh, for that particular presentation. He's also the co-author uh, with James Treffel uh, for a series of books from, Smith from the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, the first one was Exoplanets, uh, Diamond Worlds, uh, Super Earths, Pulsar Planets, and the New Search for Life Beyond Our Solar System. And he recently released last year Imagined Life, which is a follow-up to the first, and that is a speculative scientific journey among the exoplanets in search of intelligent aliens, ice creatures, and supergravity animals. That is quite a mouthful, but I, I've read both of these books. They complement each other uh, extremely well, and I was just uh, very impressed. I had to have him come back and do another performance. And so I do want to invite uh, Mike Summers uh, to join us now and to give his presentation. And again, uh, any questions that you have uh, this evening, please put them in the chat box. And after the presentation is over, I will curate from that list of questions and we'll have about 30 minutes. And so we should be able to wrap uh, the formal part of this meeting by nine o'clock. Uh, that's Eastern Daylight Time. And we'll keep, again, for those who have joined late, uh, we'll keep everything open for about another half hour until 9.30 for networking and just to, just to chat. So without further ado, Mike, you are on. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Good to go. Okay. How about the screen? Is the screen up? Let me unshare and see. There you go. Is, can you see the screen? Ah, great, great. Okay, thank you, Mike, for the, um, the, the very nice introduction. And um, good evening, everyone out there in ASA land. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak about um, probably my favorite topic in the universe, and that is um, uh, life elsewhere in the universe. I was um, incredibly fortunate to uh, grow up in a small town um, uh, about 200 miles away from the nearest big city. So at night, the sky really looked like what you see in this picture. Not the insert, the main picture. You could see the Milky Way really spectacularly, and you could see thousands of stars. Um, I know that there were thousands of them. I tried to count them several times when I was young. Turns out you can't do that for a variety of reasons, but I tried. But once that I, I learned that these were, um, that these pin points of light in the sky were, were suns just very far away. And this was like six or seven years old. I, I couldn't stop thinking about the possibility of other planets, um, of life elsewhere, of um, civilizations, advanced life. And, and I had lots and lots of questions. And my, my father thought if he got me a telescope, that would stop the questioning, but it had sort of the opposite effect. And I've never stopped asking questions about um, life elsewhere. I've, um, uh, since uh, then, I, I've had a very uh, a blessed opportunity to work on several um, uh, NASA missions uh, in our solar system to other planets, to learn about planets in our solar system, and to, um, to try to apply that to, to some of the questions uh, about planets elsewhere. When I look at, a, at an image like this, um, there's a number that keeps popping into my mind, and that's 400 billion. That's roughly speaking, very roughly, the number of stars in our galaxy. And that, that's roughly about 40, four zero times the number of people that have ever lived on Earth. I mean, think about that, 40 stars for every person that's ever lived on Earth. I mean, to me, that just blows my mind. I, I just, it, it just, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, and I'm gonna give you one of the punchlines to the talk and we'll work up to the argument behind it uh, sort of slowly. And that is based upon what we know um, about uh, habitability in our solar system, and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly tonight, and the, the things that we're learning about the frequency of planets elsewhere, is that we can extrapolate 
that there are more habitable planets in the observable universe than the, <clears throat> than the combined number of heartbeats of all the people that have ever lived on Earth. I mean, think about that. More habitable planets than the combined number of heartbeats of all the people that have ever lived on Earth. Just incredible. So I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what we've learned about life on Earth. I'm not a biologist, uh, so I'll do the best I can. Um, then I'm going to talk about our solar system and habitability in our solar system, uh, places that we've found that are habitable, not for humans, but for life, the dominant life on Earth, let's say. Then we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about habitability beyond our solar system, exoplanets. Again, not my specialty, but I'll say a few things about it. And then depending upon um, how much time I have, um, I'm going to say a little bit about life not as we know it. And, and since it's uh, life that we don't know of yet, I can't say a whole lot about it, so it's going to be mostly speculation. And then at the end, I've got a few uh, final numbers that I'm going to share with you and some final thoughts. So um, the, the, I guess the guiding question for tonight is what can we learn from the study of life on Earth and the history of life on Earth that will guide our expectations for life elsewhere in the solar system and beyond? Um, and, and that's going to be something I'm going to sort of come back to a few times. You know, what can we what, what do we know with a uh, fair degree of confidence that we can extrapolate beyond Earth? And, and that helps us turn this, this speculation about life elsewhere, which is speculation that, I mean, people have asked questions about this for, for over 2,000 years. That's what turns it into a science, the fact that we can, we can go to other planets now. We can test our ideas, test our theories, test our hypotheses, because we have evidence. And we know the laws of physics <clears throat> and chemistry pretty well. So it's now, you know, this, this field of, of study of life elsewhere, which is called astrobiology, is now a pretty respectable portion of science. And there are quite a large number of people around the world that are involved in it. So that's the guiding question. Life, and then, so... We'll see how it goes. I have a few comments I don't want to get to just yet. So life as we know it on Earth. What, what can I say about this? Okay. So um, to try to summarize it in one, one slide, it's carbon-based. Carbon is a very special atom, uh, tendency to bond with itself, very strong bonds, and, and bond with other things. It makes it a very useful um, um, element for forming large biomolecules that are very stable, but yet not too stable. Uh, the characteristics of life on Earth, things we learn about in elementary school, it exhibits growth, metabolism, motion, reproduction, response to stimuli, and, and, and evolution. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that this is a, these are a set of things that life uh, tends to exhibit because there are exceptions, like fire metabolizes, but we don't tend to think of that, about fire as being um, alive. Uh, crystals grow. But again, we don't think of them as being a lie. And then things like meals re, um, are alive, but we don't think of, uh, but they can't uh, reproduce. So there, there are exceptions. And then the requirements for life. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit about where these requirements are, are found. And from the study of life on Earth, we know that life thrives in an in extremely wide range of environments and yet always requires three things, uh, raw materials, uh, usable energy. It's not all forms of energy, like rest mass energy is not usable, um, but uh, there's plenty of chemical energy around, and liquid water. Um, it, all known organisms on Earth require liquid water at some point in their life cycle. They may not require it all the time, but it, certainly at some point they do. When we look at the history of, of life on Earth, and, and I'm not even beginning to do justice to, to these topics, um, if you try to, to sort of summarize what we know about the history of life on Earth, we know that the Earth formed about 4.56 billion years ago, and shortly after that, there's evidence that life was um, 
ubiquitous. Uh, we have fossils of cells that go back to three and a half billion years, and there's chemical signatures that now go back to even 4.2 billion years, and um, where we find uh, carbon isotope signatures uh, in um, zircon crystals that uh, suggest that um, uh, uh, biology, as we understand it, was probably going on at, at that time. And there was a global ocean 4.2 billion years ago as well. We also know that life and the biosphere have, have uh, influenced each other, co-evolved throughout history. You know, the, the obvious example, oxygen from photosynthesis, which oxygen comes from life, and yet it, it modifies the environment through oxidation and processes. Um, it creates a lot of chemicals that would normally not be here otherwise. And then life is extremely hardy and unbelievably hardy, um, and something I want to say a little bit more about. Um, the, in fact, the dominant form of life on Earth throughout most of its history has actually been bacteria. If you were to get into a time machine and just randomly step out of that time machine at some point in Earth history, most likely you would suffocate because oxygen is a recent development. Only about, uh, say, 600 million years ago did it get up to the kind of levels that would sustain you and I. So from our perspective, most of history of the Earth has, the Earth has been an extreme environment. And bacteria have, have been ubiquitous on the Earth throughout just about all of that history, except right at the beginning, like I, I said. And and we call these bacteria that are extremely hard, we call them extremophiles, another big area of research. We find them, like I said, just about everywhere, in, in acidic pools around uh, volcanic geysers, in highly uh, saline areas, in dry areas, and, and so on. Just about every place on Earth, in the deepest ocean, the top of the highest mountains, and I mean, just about uh, uh, everywhere. You could compose an interesting love song to, to them, I suppose. Um, it's kind of useful to have a, a formal definition, and, and so uh, for, for extremophiles, it's, it's usually referred to as microorganisms, but, but it's not all microorganisms, that have evolved in or adapted to extreme environments, again, as defined by, by humans. Um, many of them are, are multicellular organisms. Like at the bottom, you can see a couple of pictures. You might uh, recognize the bottom right one. It's a bit like a brine shrimp. It's called a sea monkey. Tiny little creature, about a you know, tenth to a half a millimeter in size. And on the left-hand side of the bottom is something called a methane ice worm. It's a worm that lives in methane ice at the, at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, looks a bit like an alien in a, in a sci-fi thriller, but yet it's an earthling of sorts. The, uh, I guess the most uh, famous of the extremophiles are the water bears, the tardigrades, which are um, just incredibly, uh, I, I mean, well, they're ugly for one thing. Uh, only a mother, I guess, could love something like this. But um, to a biologist, they're, they're unbelievably beautiful um, because they can, ex they can survive Temperature ranges from below freezing, far below freezing, to far above the boiling point of water. They can survive for a long period of time without water. They can dry up, and then you can reanimate them by adding water. They don't need oxygen. Um, I was surprised to find that uh, there have even been experiments of boiling these in alcohol, and they survive. They survive in, in a vacuum, and they can... Um, uh, survive in, in radiation environments that are thousands of times what you and I could survive in. Um, and this is a nice little plot that sort of summarizes some of the more um, uh, sort of, sort of uh, identifiable extremophiles. It just shows that um, you, we find them over wide ranges of salinity, uh, pH, um, temperature, and pressure, uh, the high temperature ones, we call those bottom right hand, we call them thermophiles or hyperthermophiles found in the, in the deep ocean. The psychrophiles or the cold temperature uh, extremophiles, find them underneath the glaciers. Um, 
And so the Arctic seas, bear files, high pressure, like again in, in the deep ocean. Um, and some organisms live in salt environments where the, the soil is 30% salt, like the Atacama Desert. And there are combinations of these too. We find uh, barophiles, high pressure organisms that are also thermophiles in the deep ocean. This is a dominant form of life on Earth. Now, certainly in numbers, but even in biomass, these things represent the Earth in a sense. Now, I'm not saying they're more important than you and I, but you and I certainly couldn't exist without them. So again, I'm not doing justice to any of this, but let's do a really quick Earth recap here. Life on Earth needs the three things that we learn about in elementary school, liquid water, usable energy, raw materials. The Earth has been an extreme environment almost all of its history, and there are many extreme, in, or what we call extreme environments throughout the Earth now. Because of, of that, of the first point, the first forms of life on Earth were, were extremophilic, almost certainly. Most life on Earth now is of the form we'd call extremophiles. And the other thing, which is a, sort of an inference of all this that we find when we study them, is that life fills up pretty much every available ecological niche, which uh, shows a, a little bit about the adaptability of life. And that by itself seems to give us a li little bit more of an optimistic view about life elsewhere. Okay, so with just those tools, just those bits of knowledge, what can we say then about um, habitability of other planets and moons in our solar system? So, um, well, again, in, in one slide, we could say that life as we know it, and I, from now on, I'm not going to add as we know it. When I say life, I'm going to mean life as we know it. Life as, as we know it will most likely exist on or inside planets or moons. Obviously, stars are too hot for complex organic molecules like DNA, RNA, and so on. Although some uh, cold stars um, do have molecules in the atmosphere, but they're not the complex molecules like the biomolecules that we need for life. And then there are many places that are too cold for liquid water, uh, many of the distant asteroids and comets, for instance. But on planets and moons, we find a wide mix of raw materials elements. They tend to be stable over long periods of time. They tend to have lots of a of uh, chemical energy and energy flow available to sustain life and liquid water. That's something that, that is relatively new as well. Liquid water is actually a common thing in our solar system. And as you'll see in a, in a few minutes, the earth is one of the drier places in our solar system. When I was a kid, we didn't know if there was water anywhere else in the universe. And yet to think that there's more water in some of the other solar system bodies, liquid water, than on Earth is quite uh, an astonishing result. Okay, so because of, of, of those things, again, when I was younger, we had a classical view of, of planet habitability that looked a bit like this, is that the, there was a habitable zone which extended from uh, a close distance to the sun uh, inside of which uh, liquid water was not stable on the surface of a planet because it would evaporate. But it extended only far out so that the liquid water would stay in a vapor, it wouldn't freeze, called the green zone, the habitable zone, um, the Goldilocks zone. And it's still used today as a guide to where we'd find life on the surface of a planet, um, or at least the requirements for life on, uh, on another planet. But what this sort of led us to think of, or the way it led us to think about uh, life elsewhere, was a bit like this, the Goldilocks perspective that we call it in, in our book. And that is, you know, Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, the Earth is just right, okay? That's, you know, the, the way I grew up, the way I thought about life elsewhere. And so from that perspective, you know, to find, you know, another Earth that's just like the Earth, elsewhere is, is kind of a, a hard, high bar to, to cross because it's just, there are not going to be very many places that are very close to Earth and nothing that's going to be identical to the Earth. Okay, so 
again, with that background. Now let's, let's look at, at what we've learned about our solar system. Again, it's going to be a very brief tour of, um, of uh, about 8 billion kilometers of, 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 um, uh, of, of, of um, distance and um, uh, to, to, to look at a few objects in our solar system, look at the real estate of some of the objects and look at the habitability. Okay, so uh, some of you may know all this. It, it may be second nature, so I apologize if this is a little bit slow, but for those of you who are not astronomers and don't have astronomy background, this is the way you normally see a picture uh, representing our solar system, where you have the sun in the middle and, and the planets uh, spaced out a little bit, extending from Mercury to Pluto. But, but none of this is to scale. Um, uh, the sun is actually much bigger. The planets are very spread out. And um, in fact, uh, I use light travel time in my classes to illustrate the distances. The, uh, the light travel time between the moon and the earth, remember light moves at a speed of about 300,000 kilometers per second. The light travel time between the moon and the earth is about a second, a little over a second. It's about eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. But still, at that speed, it takes about eight hours for life to get across the solar system. It's a big solar system. It's really spread out. Now, the, the, the areas that we're going to talk about are the inner solar system, where we have the four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They're mostly rocks and, and actually rocks and metals. We have the, the giant planets. Um, when I was a kid, they were called gas giants. Now we know that Jupiter and Saturn are made up of hydrogen and helium but it's not all a gas, and, and Uranus and Neptune are actually mostly ices, methane, water, and so on. We have the asteroid belt, a few million uh, rocky objects ranging in size from the size of a, a large uh, skyscraper, say to um, um, about 600 kilometers or so across. We have Pluto out here, uh, which is a member of the Kuiper belt, which is um, a, a, a belt of objects uh, that um, uh, where we, ha we know about 2,000 of them that have been identified, and by extrapolating uh, along the, the orbit of these objects, we, we can estimate there's something like 100,000 of them out here. Now, Pluto is the largest known of the Kuiper Belt objects, but statistically, we expect there would be several other Pluto-sized objects and larger objects out there in the Kuiper Belt. So 100,000 or so, a large number of these icy objects ranging in size from maybe 50 kilometers up to Pluto or so on. Okay, now we're going to take a, a tour of a few of these places. I'm going to start off at, at one of the, the harshest environments of the solar system. It's actually the hottest planet, and that's Venus. Mercury's actually closer, but Venus is hotter at the surface because of the, the very strong greenhouse effect. Now, when you look at pictures of, of Venus, you see a cloud covered planet, first of all, in, in visible light, because the, it's completely covered by sulfuric acid clouds, or actually a mix of sulfuric acid and, and water. Um, the temperature at the surface is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It would, it would melt my laptop in, in uh, a few dozen seconds. Uh, Venus is not that much different in terms of size and overall composition than the Earth. The, the big difference is that because Pluto is, I mean, because Venus is closer to the sun, that most of the carbon that would be in its rocks is oxidized and in the atmosphere. So in my um, astrobiology course, I, at this point, I'll ask my students if they think life could exist uh, on this planet. And of course, everybody says no. Well, it turns out that the, the atmosphere uh, of Venus has been simulated in laboratories, not at the surface, but at the cloud tops where liquid water is available. And sure enough, there are types of extremophiles that can survive in the, the atmosphere of Venus where the clouds reside, which is astonishing. One of the harshest environments in our solar system, perhaps the harshest planetary environment, is habitable from the perspective of acidophiles. Uh, you know, one of the common types of, of extremophiles on the Earth. Um, again, kind of an amazing result if you think about it. Go look at some other places. We'll skip over the Earth, but just assume that everyone here understands everything about the Earth, or at least enough about the Earth to, to go on. 
talk about Mars, another one of my favorite planets. So Mar the, Mars is the, the most Earth-like planet. It's not in terms of size and mass, but in terms of, of the surface <clears throat> pressure um, and the fact you can see the surface. It looks like the surface of the Earth. It looks like a desert, sort of like a high-altitude desert. It's smaller than the Earth, the, so the gravity is less. Um, it's further from the sun than the earth is, about one and a half times further from the sun than the earth. So it's colder. The average surface temperature is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there are places where it gets up just above the freezing point of water. The atmosphere is mostly CO2, some trace gases of other things like um, carbon dioxide, H2, and so on. Um, and it's a very interesting place. It's, it's a, a planet that has changed enormously in its history. Earth has too, as I said. Earth was initially a very extreme environment, uh, much more extreme than um, probably what I indicated. The temperature on the Earth was probably well above the boiling point of, of water for the first uh, couple hundred million years before it cooled off that water could, could exist. Mars has changed a lot as well, and, and there's plenty of indications of that, plenty of evidence of that. When we look at the surface, we see canyons that that dwarf the Grand Canyon on the Earth, the canyons that are 3,000 miles across Valles Marineris. Um, we see volcanoes the size of New Mexico that sort of put to shame the, the largest volcanoes on Earth, uh, like the Hawaiian Islands, um, even much larger than the volcanoes on Venus. That one volcano, Olympus Mons, that's shown there um, should have put out enough water in its existence to cover the surface of Mars to a depth of about a kilometer. An indication that there's probably, you know, water on Mars at one time, or at least an inference. And, and obviously we see evidence of water. Um, in our pictures of, of Mars from orbit, these are dried up lakes and creeks, and we see evidence of flood features. We see uh, ancient sort of fossilized beaches, um, and so on. Evidence of a large amount of water. And there, there's other types of physical evidence as, as well of water. The isotopes of various elements show that the lighter elements have escaped from Mars, heavy elements have, have stayed, which shows your temperature is lowered. There's a, a, a variety of different um, minerals that have been found that uh, show that water have been there. And we have the... the um, the, the landers and rovers on Mars that have given us a large amount of information about the nature of its surface and its history. This is a picture uh, taken from the inside of the Gale Crater where the Curiosity rover is now, looking at uh, the, sort of the central mound feature in, in the Gale Crater. You see all these layers of rocks. These are sedimentary rocks. Um, and in sedimentary rocks, uh, these are rocks that are formed when you have sediments in the bottom of seas and, and um, oceans that, that lithify over time. And so this indicates that um, this region was once underwater. All these sediments were laid down. They became rocks, uh, different hardnesses and so on. Um, and then at some point, there was a, a, a large uh, uh, epoch, I'd say a long epoch of weathering or erosion. So much of this stuff was, was eroded away, most likely with water. So at least two episodes of large amounts of water on Mars. And when we, we and as I said, there are other evidences as well. And when we add all that stuff together, we can estimate how much water was on Mars at, at um, uh, early in its history. And it turns out to be about two kilometers equivalent thickness averaged over the surface of Mars. Mars was once warm and wet and habitable, even for conditions, even conditions that where you and I could, could walk around, maybe not breathe, but we could certainly walk around and um, um, it'd be in the right pressure and temperature range for us to, to enjoy. But what has happened? Well, somehow the, the atmosphere was lost. We think it was due to solar wind interactions, at least partially. And so the surface of Mars is not habitable now, okay? It, it, um, it, it doesn't have liquid water uh, because it doesn't have an ozone layer. Ultraviolet radiation will penetrate to the surface. The, the atmosphere naturally produces hydrogen peroxide, which saturates the top few centimeters of the soil, which you know, is, is any parent knows 
that has had a kid, you use hydrogen peroxide to sterilize cuts. Um, and so it, it sterilizes, it, it kills cells. So the surface of Mars is not habitable today, even though it was long ago. Um, but underground, you go more than a few centimeters thickness of the soil under that region, um, there are organisms on Earth that would be happy, or at least as happy as, say, bacteria can be. Um, there's plenty of raw materials, plenty of carbon. There's plenty of chemical energy. Geothermal energy might be there, though it's a little bit hard to know how much is there now. And there's water, ice at the surface and liquid at depth. Okay, so underneath the, the surface of Mars, there's, there's all the requirements for life. And furthermore, um, that environment has been, uh, has been simulated in the laboratory. The, the surface of Mars, the atmosphere of Mars has been simulated in a, in, in a laboratory. And, and there are organisms on the Earth that, that thrive in those environments. And they're, they're a type of extrema for what we call a, a methanogen. They don't look like this. This is um, a picture from um, uh, one of my, my favorite books uh, when I was in, in high school thinking about astrobiology. Uh, this is a, a, a cartoon, um, a, an artist's conception of something called a, a Mars uh, water seeker, totally imaginary. Uh, this is how life was imagined. It might be on Mars, um, a, a creature that um, had a big nose to puncture into the ground to search for water, had big ears to hear in the, the thin atmosphere of Mars, and then those uh, had a parasol that would fold up around it to keep it warm at night. Well, that's not what Mars life is going to be like. We can be pretty confident of that. Mars life, if it does exist, and we don't know for sure that it does, would be uh, an extremophile, methanogens, methanogenic bacteria or bacteria that produce methane, from the metabolism of carbon dioxide and H2, um, and they're common um, on Earth. Uh, they're so common, in fact, that the air you're breathing is probably about one, uh, one, one millionth, let's say a little bit more than that, say one one hundred thousandth of um, the air you're breathing is methane. It, it's commonly produced by, uh, in uh, biomass decay um, and, um, and and some geochemical regions, almost always, I would say 90% level, is due to methanogenic bacteria, bacteria that we know can live in the soils on Mars. Mars is habitable now from the perspective, again, of, of um, one representative of the dominant life form on Earth. Mars is habitable. And uh, I apologize for my dog. He's gotten loose. He's supposed to be kept quiet to, tonight, but... Um, uh, my apologies, life sometimes intrudes. And we may, in fact, see evidence of life intruding on, on Mars here. Uh, this is a, a color-coded map of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, recently detected, detonative detections around 2002. Uh, more recently, the Curiosity rover was able to measure methane in the atmosphere. And as you remember, most methane on Earth is produced by bacteria. So where does this stuff come from? Uh, we don't know. And we know that this gas is also being destroyed very rapidly. And if we uh, calculate that destruction rate, it turns out to be like 100 years or less. So when we see methane in the atmosphere of Mars, it means that it's been produced within the last 100 years or so. So there's something producing it, something interesting that's producing it, chemical activity. And we know that the subsurface is, is habitable for uh, methanogens. So does that mean that, that we've discovered life on Mars? Well, not hardly. You need a little bit more proof than that. But it's certainly intriguing. It's certainly a, a plausible because the Earth and Mars has been spitting um, meteorites back and forth uh, for billions of years. It's possible that the Earth seeded Mars at some time in the past, but we don't know. This is a, an outstanding question, and, and it's going to be sort of interesting. It could be that we've already discovered evidence of life on Mars. Okay, I'm, now I'm going to jump out to uh, much further from the sun. I'll talk about the Jupiter system. Um, I'm not going to talk about Jupiter. Jupiter is amazing. It's an incredible planet. Uh, the picture in the upper left is, act is actually to scale. That's Jupiter, uh, the Earth, the side of it. If you could put them side by side, that's how they would sort of look. 
you can see the great red spot, which is a big storm in the atmosphere of Jupiter, a storm bigger than the Earth um, that's churning away, uh, not exactly like a hurricane, but has some features somewhat like a hurricane. The interesting thing for this talk is, is the fact that Jupiter has four interesting moons called the Galilean moons, the ones that Galileo discovered when he took his little telescope and looked up at Jupiter. And, and sure enough, even with binoculars, you can, you can see some of these moons sort of moving back and forth night to night. With a little, te little telescope, you can see them quite nicely. Um, these four moons form a, a nice little system, a bit like a miniature planetary system around Jupiter. Actually, in the upper right-hand corner here, I have um, a, a copy of a sketch from Galileo's notebook showing the way he saw all four of the moons around um, uh, Jupiter. I wonder what Galileo would think now at these pictures that we have from um, other spacecraft. Uh, again, this is not uh, uh, the actual layout. These are individual pictures that have been put close together. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, the four Galilean moons. Uh, Io first, okay? Uh, this is what I did my PhD thesis on, in, in fact, on the atmosphere of, of Io. Uh, it's the most volcanically active object in the solar system. It's um, so volcanically active that it turns itself inside out every 200 million years or so. At any given time, there are about 300 large volcanoes or fissure eruptions going on. Um, and you can see these, these colors, the, the reds and the, the, the yellows and the blacks and the oranges. These are different allotropes of sulfur and some sulfur dioxide. Um, and, and even in the lower right, we, you can see a, 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 a sort of little sequence of images that have been stacked together from a little video of a volcano close to the north polar regions of, uh, of Io. This was a volcano that was captured in images as the New Horizons spacecraft flew by Jupiter to get a slingshot into the outer solar system. We stole some of Jupiter's uh, momentum, um, not to be repaid. And that little volcano there is, is shooting stuff up around 300 miles high. I'm sorry, 300 kilometers high. It's a pretty active, pretty energetic volcano. Now, I'm not going to argue that there's life on Io. Um, that's not the reason I'm showing you this. The reason I'm showing you this is to show you that there, there are energy sources in the outer solar system that are not solar, that are not dependent upon sunlight. Jupiter itself emits more energy than it receives from the sun. Io, all this volcanism is due to tidal interactions, gravitational interactions between Jupiter, Io, and the other Galilean moons. The frictional forces, they orbit back and forth. That's energy that can drive geology, that can drive chemistry, that perhaps can drive biology. Maybe not on Io, but on the next moon out, which is Europa. Uh, this is a moon, when you look at the pictures of it, you see sort of a whitish ball um, crisscrossed by dark fractures. What you're seeing there is water ice with a lot of dark material sort of dirtying, if you will, the surface. A lot of cracks and fissures, which indeed are cracks and fissures through the ice to, the, to a subsurface ocean of liquid water underneath that ice. The ice is, is the thickness is not... Uh, precisely known at somewhere probably in the range of a few kilometers, maybe up to 100 kilometers, depending upon location. But the cracks go deep enough so that something from the ocean inside of it makes its way up onto the surface and then coats the surface. We don't know what that stuff is. Is it, is it salts or is it something more uh, organic? Organic meaning uh, carbon-rich molecules, not necessarily life. This ocean uh, of water is actually salty, it has a salinity, much like the, the oceans on the Earth. This moon, Europa, I'm so, yeah, Europa has more liquid water just underneath this ice crust than all the oceans on Earth combined. This is a wetter place than the Earth, again, if you will. Um, we see geysers, and we actually we see one geyser uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, some images here that have been stacked to bring out uh, a plume of water um, actually, evidence of water that come out of the interior. Um, and this was um, taken, as I said, by Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the, the, the plumes are not frequent enough for us to see them often. We're going to have to have a mission dedicated to uh, 
Europa to be able to study the, what comes out of the in, interior. We just don't have the capability of studying it easily from the Earth. But there's a potential of studying what's inside of Europa by studying stuff that's coming out of it. But the interior of Europa inside the subsurface ocean is habitable. Room temperature plus or minus a little bit. Um, it has raw materials and it's heated by below from the same mechanism that heats Io. Lots of energy, lots of raw materials, lots of liquid water, all the requirements for life, a very active place where there's energy flow. Uh, this is a cartoon that sort of illustrates what we think might be a, a cross section of the ice and the, the layers below it and then the, the subsurface where the volcanoes that were on the surface on Io are actually underneath the ocean at the base of the ocean in Europa. A habitable place, perhaps an ocean 100 kilometers thick or so. Now, the other two moons, I'll just skip over them now. I'll mention them briefly, though. Ganymede and Callisto are two other moons that we now suspect also have oceans of salty liquid water underneath an ice crust. Okay? So three of the four moons of Jupiter are habitable from the perspective of the dominant life form on Earth. Again, not in terms of intelligence or, or you know, our perspective, but from the perspective of biomass. Um, it's an incredible thought to think that the Earth representatives could live, thrive in these environments. Now let's go to Saturn. Okay, Saturn's the, the beautiful planet um, that, you know, it has a spectacular rings. It was the first planet I ever saw in a telescope when I was um, about six years old. It didn't look like this, but it, uh, uh, my memories of it are just as good as this, but it didn't quite look that well. It's a, it's a very uh, amazing planet and ring system. Storms in the shape of a hexagon. How do you get something like that from the natural laws? A storm, a rotating storm in the shape of a geometrical figure like a hexagon. I mean, that by itself, I could give a whole talk on, 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 on that. Simple laws of physics, you can write them down on the... the um, uh, one sheet of paper or half sheet of paper, <clears throat> and they give rise to things that are this unexpected. Um, as interesting as all this is, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about two of the moons of, um, of Saturn. Titan, which is uh, um, uh, the largest moon in our solar system. It has an atmosphere that is mostly nitrogen, uh, it has lakes and seas of um, hydrocarbons, complex organic molecules. The picture in the upper right shows the, the sunlight glinting off of the, the ocean or the si seas. I shouldn't call it an ocean. Off the seas and the lakes, uh, that's uh, sun glint. Um, we could actually work out even the roughness of the waves on, on, from looking at that glint. Uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere um, has a small amount of methane mixed with it. That methane is, is uh, chemically altered by sunlight, ultraviolet radiation to produce hydrocarbons, a bit like photochemical smog. And from that photochemistry, carbon-rich compounds fall out onto the surface. And we think that's the source of the lakes, complex organic molecules. Uh, and the seas actually have, have islands that bob up and down. Sometimes they sink, sometimes they float. Very interesting um, from a physics and chemistry perspective. But the biological potential, we think, is the fact that just underneath this, this atmosphere and, and surface is another ocean of liquid water, even thicker uh, than, the oceans are on, than the ocean on Europa. Again, more liquid water than all the oceans on the Earth combined. Very interesting place. That was the biggest moon in our solar system, Titan. Enceladus is one of the smaller moons uh, around Saturn. And you can see in the upper right just how small it is, just, you know, a thousand kilometers across or so. Uh, it's very bright, though. It's, it's very white. It looks as bright as freshly fallen snow because it really is water crystals that have fallen on the surface from the interior of Enceladus. Plumes of, of steam 
shoot up into space. Gravity brings the, the, the water back down. It condenses into tiny particles of, of ice that fall onto the surface. Uh, the Galileo spacecraft, uh, I'm sorry, the Casino spacecraft discovered these. It was a, in fact, it flew through these plumes to sample the composition. It's not all water, it's salty water. Again, salinity, not that different from what we find on the Earth. And there's other things there, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and, and complex organic molecules. There's even molecular hydrogen, stuff that's just like candy for, for these, some of these bacteria that I've been talking about. There's a subsurface ocean inside of Enceladus. Even small moons have somehow enough heat to keep water in a liquid form so that it doesn't freeze. And again, it's the water's somewhat around room temperature. Again, plus or minus a little bit, the salinity can change the, the, the freezing point, of course. So this is another place that is habitable from the perspective of certain types of extremophiles. I'm gonna jump further out now. I'm gonna skip over um, a cross section of Enceladus, as interesting as it is. I wanna to go to the outer regions of our solar system uh, and talk about my, my favorite uh, planet. Um, and I'm gonna to refer to Pluto as a planet because that's what it is. Um, Pluto is out here in, in the Kuiper belt. Uh, it's a member of the Kuiper belt of objects. I, as I talked about early in, the, in, in this talk, about 100,000 of these objects out there uh, ranging in distances from about the, you know, as far as distances from the sun, which is uh, 30 astronomical units or 30 times the sun Earth distance to around 50 times the sun Earth distance. So Pluto's very far away with sunlight at least a thousand times less than, than the intensity we would measure at the surface of the Earth. So a place that we expected to be incredibly cold, um, incredibly dead, because of the fact that it's small, and it's probably cooled off a lot since it formed. And yet we were so astonished when we got there. I, I spent over 20 years of my life um, studying Pluto, planning uh, with others, the New Horizons spacecraft mission. And when we got there in 2015, I, I cannot tell you how surprised we were. We expected to be surprised in some ways, but we were surprised in, in every way imaginable by what we found on Pluto. We found glaciers of ice, nitrogen ice, um, also ices of other things, carbon monoxide, methane, water ice. We found, uh, we discovered the first ice volcano. Uh, I mean, cryovolcano. Um, it sounds like a contradiction in terms. Uh, you know, volcanoes on the earth uh, connect the, the deep mantle with the surface of the earth. The mantle is a sort of a semi-molten rock under high pressure that forces its way up through cracks and fissures and explodes into the surface of the earth and creates the, the volcanic constructs that we call volcanoes. On Pluto, we have liquid water inside, a thick layer of liquid water, an ocean of liquid water under high pressure, relatively speaking, that water forces its way up through cracks and fissures and explodes into the surface, creating Volcanoes, ice volcanoes, evidence for liquid water, at least inside of, the, of Pluto at some point. Now, since then, we have evidence that the liquid water is still there. And the dark regions in, in the left-hand picture, in the lower left, you see this big swath of dark regions, Cthulhu Regio. These are complex hydrocarbons uh, called tholins. We don't have a chemical formula for them. They're just... Uh, um, a thick, like organic residue about the consistency of actual grease, something like that. But it's carbon enriched materials. Um, the, the source of that could be from, I'm sorry, could be from the interior or could be from the atmosphere. We don't know. When we look at the volcanoes though, and you can see if you look very carefully, you can see a little bit of a reddish sort of russet color region around the volcano. In terms of a color, it's very much like the color of the thick organic residues we find in Cthulhu Regio. So it perhaps came up from the interior. We can't be sure of that. It could be a coincidence, but we just don't know for sure just yet. Another surprise, a dried up lake. Of all the things I did not expect to find at Pluto was a dried up lake. If you look in the lower left-hand corner of this, you see what looks like an upside down shark's tooth. That 
uh, is the outline of a lake that was present uh, at one time. And you can see how the, the, the beach receded uh, and it got smaller and smaller until finally what was left froze. And then you have something like a bit like an ice rink that's left there. We don't know what the fluid was. Um, it probably was not water though, but we, we don't know exactly what it was. But at some point, Pluto had an atmosphere with the pressure that would sustain liquids on the surface. Kind of interesting. Uh, and there are other interesting regions that, that give us all sorts of evidence about the history of, um, of Pluto. On, most of this image shows the, that large glacier, the large white area in the first picture of Pluto, um, which is Splitnik Planitia, which was a, a, a glacier a few million square kilometers across. Uh, and on the left are ice mountains, literally chunks of ice as, you know, kilometers across it. They're, they're ice cubes, the biggest ice cubes in the solar system. And if you look, they're sprinkled with more of this reddish material, which um, we think is probably carbon enriched materials of some sort. And if you look really carefully, and I don't know if you can see it in, it in this picture, but some of these mountains are in the shape of tabular slabs, and inside of them, you can see layers of this dark material. We don't know what that is either. The atmosphere um, was just astonishing. This is a picture of um, a sunset um, on uh, Pluto. The sun is actually over the horizon, si shining through the atmosphere. And there are particulates in the atmosphere, aerosols, haze particles that are, again, complex organic molecules. And these are small particles, so they're high forward scattering, so it lights up the foreground. We didn't expect to get pictures like this, but the sunsets were so brilliant that it lit up the landscape and we could get this picture. Well, the atmosphere is a very vibrant place with complex meteorology, complex chemistry, and it produces complex organic materials naturally. The interior of, of Pluto has a, an ocean of liquid water, as I suggested earlier, by looking at the ice volcano. Uh, how can Pluto, which should have cooled off, be too cold for water four billion years ago, how can it have a, an ocean of liquid water? We don't know the answer to that question. There's clearly some heat source in the interior. It cannot be tidal dissipation like on Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. It has to be something else, maybe radioactive nucleides, um, although that has problems as well as hypothesis. But there's something that is driving the geology and keeping the, the, uh, this ocean in, in the form of a, of a liquid. Pluto is habitable from the perspective of some of the extremophiles on the Earth. Let's skip over this. So, and, and keep in mind, there are 100,000 of these objects in the Kuiper Belt. Now, not all as big as Pluto, but we know that objects as small as Enceladus a thousand kilometers across has, uh, can have an internal ocean. How many of these, and I'm just asking the question, how many of these could have subsurface oceans as well? So where's the liquid water in our solar system? I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't know if there was liquid water anywhere else. Well, the, the cube, the upper left, is, uh, it represents the, the volume of water on Earth. Europa has more than that, probably around two to three times the amount. Titan is 13 times, Callisto 12 to 14. Ganymede, it's uncertain, probably somewhere around 10 to 20 times the amount of liquid water that the, the Earth has. As I said earlier, the Earth is one of the drier places in our solar system. So what does it say about habitability? Well, remember this picture of the, the classical view or the, the, the Hebel zone I showed you earlier which gave us this perspective on habitability. Well, now what we found with our studies, our missions that have gone to these places, is that there are many places in our solar system that are habitable from the dominant form of life on the Earth. We talk about Mars, we talk about Venus and Titan and Europa and, and Pluto and, and um, Enceladus. I didn't get a chance to talk about Ganymede and Callisto, but there are other places. One of the asteroids, Ceres, has an ocean of brine. I'm not sure it's proper to talk about that as an ocean, but it's a layer of brine underneath the surface. There's another moon of Neptune called Triton, which is a, a good candidate for a subsurface ocean. You add it up, this is like 10 places in our solar system 
that are habitable. Now, what about habitability beyond our solar system? This is not my, my field, but I want to say a few things about some of the things that, that we've, we've learned. And, and keep in mind, we've only studied a very small portion of just our galaxy, which is an infinitesimal portion of, of all of creation. And you've, I'm sure you've heard about the Kepler Space Telescope and how it's used um, the transits of planets going across stars to detect planets around those stars. And it's, it's a, I can't do justice to the field, but I want to say a few things. The numbers of planets are incredible. <clears throat> Every time I give a talk, I have to check something called the, the Extrasolar Planet Encyclopedia to get the latest numbers on how many planets have been discovered. As of this morning, it was 4,301 planets that had been discovered and confirmed around other stars, mostly stars that are nearby Earth within a couple hundred light years or so. Earlier this week, when I started putting these slides together, it was 4,291. Ten new planets in just a few days. The average rate of discovery, if you add it up over you know, a few years, is about one per day. Think about that discovering one new planet every day on average. And the rate is going to be increasing with, um, with the test mission that's uh, now uh, giving some early results on, on exoplanets. Um, there are lots of exoplanets out there. I can't do justice to what, we've, what they've found, but one thing I want to point out is that the dominant size of planet or just, I'd say the most likely size of planet that's found is something that's from about Earth size to maybe just a little bit bigger than the Earth, a super Earth, as they say. Maybe one and a quarter to two or three times the size of the Earth. So Earth-like planets, and Earth-like in terms of just science, you kind of, I kind of get into trouble if you say Earth-like um, without qualifying that. I just mean size here. Uh, they're common. Earth-like planets are commonplace. Um, some of these systems are younger than our solar system, but some are older. There's one system that's about 8 billion years old. In other words, there's a planet there that presumably is 3 billion years older than the Earth. I mean, what, is, what would evolution do on Earth in another 3 billion years? And exoplanets are incredibly diverse. And like, again, I, I can only say that you have to, to read about it to, to understand just how mind-blowingly diverse they are. What are some common types? Well, there are Goldilocks worlds. There are planets in the Goldilocks zone that are Earth-sized, Earth-like, um, that probably can sustain liquid water on the surface. They are rocky and metallic, presumably, in terms of composition because they have the right density. Um, the Kepler-186 system is one of the, the that was discovered a few years ago. It's very Earth-like in terms of its size and, and uh, the heat energy it gets from the sun. Very nice candidate planet. There are several dozen of these types of planets known that are very much like the Earth in terms of habitability on the surface. Okay, So even surface life has a potential there. There are other planets that are much more like Europa. In fact, there are many that appear to exist outside of the habitable zone where they are too cold for liquid water on the surface. Captain B is one. Um, and yet it's probably Earth-like in the sense that it's rocky and metallic with the density is not precisely known, but it's probably of that form. So how am I doing on time? Mike, just stop me when you, when you need me to, to, to end. I, I've got about 10 more minutes to go um, of my slides, but I might no, go over two sure. minutes. So uh, anyhow, in, in the book that, that I wrote with uh, Jim Treffel, we talked about a canonical ice planet like this, Iceheim. We just made up a name, name Iceheim. What kind of life would you expect to, to Earth-like that you would expect to find there? Of course, all the things that I talked about that can live at high pressure and low temperature. Sacrophiles, the ideal candidate, methane ice worms, especially if there are layers of methane in, in the, or methane hydrates, clathrates inside of this. Um, and if these objects still have internal energy, like the Earth is still cooling off from its formation, it also has heat from radioactive decay, 
then you could expect that with a lot of water, there's going to be oceans of liquid water underneath an ice cover, even though it's outside of the habitable zone. I have to go a little bit quick now. Another type of planet uh, that has been talked about a lot, water worlds. Okay, uh, GJ1214b is one of them. It's a super Earth. It's about 2.7 times the diameter of the Earth. Uh, has a density which suggests that it's mostly water. I mean, think about that. You know, 30 years ago, we didn't know if there was water elsewhere. Now that we know that there are planets that are mostly water, water through and through uh, elsewhere. Not at the core. There's probably rock and metal in the core, maybe an Earth-sized core of rock and metal. But outside of that is water. Now, at these pressures, the water might be in different phases, or almost certainly will be in different phases than the kind of ice that we normally put in our drinks. Um, but there are, you know, at least a half a dozen different phases that have been studied um, at higher pressures for ice that uh, are suitable candidates for the interior. Even one that's called hot ice, which is ice that, that it, which is water that forms a crystalline structure at high temperature and high pressure. What kind of life would you expect in an ocean that's hundreds, perhaps a thousand kilometers deep in terms of liquid water as we have on the Earth? Well, there you could speculate all day long about uh, the kind of life that we have in the deep oceans on the Earth being able to live in places like that. Even intelligence, like, uh, like octopi, incredibly intelligent things. If you've never seen the, the YouTube video of an octopus, that's locked inside of a jar with a screw top, unscrewing the top from the inside and getting out. Check out that YouTube video, it's really amazing. They're smart. Um, life in the deep ocean, maybe light in a very dark environment. Well, we know squids in the deep ocean of the earth, they have eyes the size of dinner plates. Maybe the eyes of some of these creatures, if they existed, would be the size of buses, I mean, if they use visible light at all, maybe they use something else like infrared light or, or uh, electrical signatures. But the fact is that, that we have analogs of these kind of, of regions, hapo regions in our solar system. Um, one system I'll just mention, um, a crowded system is TRAPPIST-1 that has seven, which you might call Earth-like planets, uh, three of which are in the habitable zone. Liquid water being stable on the surface, and the densities of these objects seem to suggest that they could be highly enriched in water. Um, so they could have oceans of, of water. Uh, TRAPPIST-1d is probably um, a little bit too close to the sun, its star, to um, have water stable on the surface, even if it doesn't have an atmosphere, to, to raise the temperature through a greenhouse effect. And then H uh, might be right on the outside edge for, uh, for water, ice, or something like that. But nonetheless, you've got Earth-like planets that probably have water that do exist. We know that they're out there. A common type of terrestrial planet that's or relatively common that's found elsewhere is, is planets that are tidally locked to those central star, a bit like um, our moon is tidally locked to the Earth. You know, you go out and you look at the moon, you always see the same side. Well, um, you know, the, the moon then is tidally locked to the Earth. If the Earth was a star, it would always shine on just that same side, and the far side of the moon would never get any sunlight. There are planets that are close enough to the central star, Earth-like planets, terrestrial-type planets, that are probably tidally locked. And there's been lots of speculation about what habitability would be like um, on such planets. If you had a, a mostly dry planet, you could have the water congregated on the night side in these vast glaciers with the day side hot desert, or perhaps as hot as even a magma, and a habitable zone, which would be a halo or terminator region right around the, the, the edge of the, the boundaries between those two. If it was a, a, a planet that's tidally locked, that's an ocean. It could be all ocean, or it could have ice on one side and mostly melted on another side. And very interesting meteorology. It's a very interesting topic That's uh, as well. I'll just skip over it. And there are planets that are Earth-like in the sense of uh, density, probably mostly rock and, and metals. 
uh, but yet are much bigger than the Earth. And just mention this one, uh, just as a sort of a, a prototype for a high gravity world. Um, we call this big boy in our book. If you speculate about life as we know it, that might exist there, uh, it would have to be a life that could survive in such a high gravity world. We couldn't. If we fell, we would break bones in our body, perhaps most of the bones in our body, because the gravity here is you know, more than two times the gravity at the surface of the earth. On the other hand, if there was life in an ocean, that would help somewhat by burying the, the uh, forces, giving you more, more um, by the buoyancy, giving you a little bit less of difference in pressure and you wouldn't fall quite as uh, hard as you would if you sedimented to the bottom. Um, if you did have an organism that lived on the surface, it would probably have to be something like a skate, I would suggest, at least again, if it's life as we know it, slithering around on, on the surface. And then one of the, my favorite categories is uh, the rogue world or the dark world, the Steppenwolf planets, the, the, uh, the dark planets, planets that um, are apparently very numerous, but that are not gravitationally bound to stars at all. And, and the, the evidence is really weak at this point, not good statistics, but it appears like that there are at least as many of these planets as there are planets that orbit stars. Are they dead and cold because they're far from a central star? Not necessarily at all. If they're as big as the Earth or bigger, they probably have internal heat from their formation still being released or from radioactive decay. If there's something like Jupiter and its set of moons, it, if you took Jupiter and its moons and just put that in the interstellar medium, not much would change because Jupiter gets its energy from its interior, from gradual shrinkage, and the, the moons get their heat from the, the tidal dissipation. Life, what, how would it communicate in a dark environment like that? Well, perhaps by um, uh, light, uh, visible light. If you ever get a chance to go to some of these uh, new aquarium uh, <clears throat> regions where they've, they've, uh, uh, they have uh, environments for jellyfish, like the Monterey Aquarium or Toronto or, or even Baltimore now, where you have these creatures that communicate by um, uh, light flickering and, and movement. And there are all sorts of other types. Um, there are planets orbiting pulsars, planets that orbit multiple stars. There are carbon-rich planets that were nicknamed diamond planets, metallic planets, hot Jupiters, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> Mike, how much time do I have? Uh, we're about uh, four minutes over, but uh, I think we've, we can uh, entertain a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay. So I asked one of my students to come up with a, a picture of what life not like us would be, and this is what he, he sent me, um, sort of ET-ish. That wasn't what, exactly what I had in mind. When I, when I asked him for a life not like us, I was thinking, what about life that's not carbon-based? Maybe it's based upon some other element, like silicon. And, or maybe it uses some other vol, uh, liquid um, other than water, maybe methane or ammonia or something. <clears throat> and it turns out that there's a lot of speculation on this. I don't have time again to get into it. But there are, in, there are environments out there that may be analogous to water on the earth. Like even Titan itself is a methane-rich environment. It probably has layer or regions that are mostly methane, liquid methane. Does that mean that organisms that evolved there, would they evolve to utilize a liquid methane as a, as a substance that carries raw materials into the cell and, and waste products out of the cell? We don't know, of course, but it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical possibility that you could have liquid like that on planets elsewhere if you have it in our solar system. No proof, of course. What about life that doesn't die or that life that lives in rocks in the deep interior or in the atmospheres of brown dwarfs? Again, this is something we, we have zero information about, okay? So it's hard to say anything of substance about any of this. But one of the things that, that I've learned in, in planetary sciences, especially working with the, the deep space missions, is that we're always surprised at what we find when we get to another planet or we get to another comet or asteroid or we have a bigger telescope is that we're always surprised. And, 
and after a while, you get to where you know you're going to be surprised, so you prepare for it, and yet you're still surprised. You're, in fact, you're surprised that you're surprised. It's, it's something that it's hard to articulate. If you haven't experienced it, it's just it's something that's hard to convey. But that's what happens. It's like the universe is always one step ahead of us in terms of what is out there. Um, you almost have to go to science fiction. I'm going to skip over all of this stuff. I just don't have time to do it justice. So I'm going to just end with, with talking about the numbers again. <clears throat> I, I was just fascinated with big numbers when I was a kid. You know, this, this number of the stars in our galaxy, just I, I could not get it out of my mind. I still can't. It, it just, it's overwhelming. Um, and, and then all of you have seen the picture of, the, of the, the Hubble image of the distant universe called the deep field. And this image, which is uh, looking at an area of the sky that's about the size of a diamond held 40, a, a dime held 40 feet away. Tiny little fraction of the sky has 5,000 galaxies in it. There are lots of galaxies out there. In fact, there are more galaxies in the visible universe is in the visible universe than there are stars in our galaxy. So let's go back and look at the numbers again. And and this is if if this doesn't blow your mind, I, I give up. The number of stars in our galaxy, four and eleven zeros. The combined number of heartbeats of all the people that ever lived on Earth is about one in twenty zeros. The combined number of grains of sand on all the beaches on the Earth, about one and twenty-two zeros. The estimated number of habitable planets, habitable the way I described habitability earlier, is one and 24 zeros. So for every heartbeat of every person that's ever lived on Earth, there are something on the order of 10,000 habitable planets in the observable universe. And of course, that's a lower limit because it's based upon what we see and extrapolate. There's a lot that we can't see. And... It's based upon what we understand about physics and chemistry, and that limits us to life as we know it. So I'm going to stop at that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get through all this stuff, but I just don't have time to do it justice. And I'll take any kind of questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. We do have some questions from the audience here, and uh, I think I, I see a few themes. So we'll... Uh, We'll throw you a softball question here, which I really don't think is a softball. But uh, So what assumptions are made about the possible moons about these exoplanets? For example, we, you know, given what we see in our own solar system, do you expect something similar for other you know, lunar systems? Well, from what I've given in this talk, I don't make any assumptions about moons around, other, uh, about around exoplanets. And, and at this point, as far as I'm aware, we have not discovered moons. Maybe there's one exception. Maybe I, I have to check on that. But I know that there are not many moons that have been discovered around exoplanets. They're, it's very hard to detect them. Again, it's not my field. So um, <clears throat> are they there? <laughs> I can only give you my guess. Um, and I would say almost certainly that they're there. Are they easy to find? No. Uh, what are they like? Um, we only have our solar system to guide us uh, and the laws of physics and chemistry. And so I suspect that like, if they're there, they're going to be like, at least in terms of diversity, like the moons in our solar system, which range in size from mount mountains up to things that are, that are you know, 3,000 kilometers across and that, are, that encompass all sorts of different environments. So uh, again, but that's just a guess. I, I, I don't know enough to make assumptions about moons around exoplanets. Okay, uh, another question, uh, this one, uh, another question about moons, but one that may be within your, your uh, area of expertise, uh, Europa. How thick is the ice? Yeah. And how deep do scientists believe the water is? And then uh, the follow-up question to that would be, how is the salinity of the water detected? So how thick is the ice? How deep the water? How do they detect salinity? Yeah, very important questions because NASA has put Europa at a high priority for, for um, uh, a mission uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, Europa uh, Clipper will be an, uh, a, 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 a mission to, to actually try to answer those, some of those questions at least. 
Uh, we don't know the thickness of the ice, um, and we don't know the thickness of the ocean, but we have um, ranges, and, and the range for the thickness of the ice goes something like from about 10 kilometers maybe to 60 or 70 kilometers. That's the kind of ranges that, that we have. The depth, about the only thing we can say about the depth is that it cannot be a large fraction of the radius of Europa because then it would affect the measurements that we have of the overall density of Europa. So that constrains us to say from 60 to 100 kilometers maximum uh, top depth to maybe a few hundred kilometers at the bottom of the, the ocean. Um, the, the question about salinity is tied in with the question about detectability to begin with. The way the, the ocean was detected, we don't see it uh, directly, so you have to infer it. And the way it, it was discovered was that uh, Europa modifies the, um, the electric and magnetic field around it in ways that are, um, are or what you would expect if you had a conductor like salty water just underneath the surface at those two ranges I was telling you about. So um, you, you very quickly, when you try to look at candidates for that, it can't be copper, it can't be you know, iron or those kind of things uh, for various you know, reasons. Uh, so you're stuck with salty water. In fact, the ice itself we can see is water. It's, it's H2O, but in, a, in an ice form on the surface. The salinity comes about when you look at the magnitude of the electric and magnetic field perturbations as spacecraft fly uh, by the, the, the moon. And the, the perturbations, the amplitudes suggest that somewhere in the range of say two to maybe 4% salinity. And that's not that different than that of the oceans on the earth, which are two to 3% salinity. So um, it's, in this, it's in the same range, put it that way, maybe a little bit more salty than the, the oceans on the earth. But uh, it, that's tied in with the, the detection itself. Okay. Hey, uh, Dr. Summers, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, we're going to move to kind of a, you know, a more uh, a social setting. There we go. Okay, so I'll do this now. I think you're good. Can everyone see everyone else? Did that do it? I think so. Okay. All right. So uh, here we have a question about, you know, possible intelligent alien life. Uh, with the differences in their biochemical makeup, and if you can hear that, that is thunder uh, hitting Richmond right now, or big storm. Uh, so would the differences in their biochemical makeup more likely make them resistant to our diseases and pathogens or prohibitively uh, vulnerable? Well, um, I'm not a biologist. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a medical scientist. So it's way outside of my field of expertise. So I'm going to pass on that question. I'm not sure I could do, I could, I could, I could do justice to it at all. I mean, first of all, keep in mind, we've not discovered life elsewhere. And the kinds of questions that are asked there are questions that we ask about COVID-19. All right, let's see what we've got here. Um, how do you determine the ages of planets? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, there's, there are several things. The, a planet like the Earth um, is, is very evolved. Uh, the surface changed enormously since it was formed. And so we can't go out and look at rocks or, or uh, you know, anything we pick up to, to and, and date that, find out how old it is, and determine the age of the Earth. But there are things in the solar system that we can look at and we can date with radioactive decay. For instance, the rocks on the moon that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts. Those give a range of dates from regions where, like uh, the Sea of Tranquility, where there were lava flows, that go back around 3.8 to 4.2 billion years. So that lava was present as a liquid that long ago. The older rocks from the highlands are a little bit older than that. So that's like a lower limit to the age of our Earth-Moon system, or at least when the moon formed. 
and, and we believe now that the moon formed from a collision of another planet with the Earth, so that would be a lower limit to how old the Earth is. But there are other things out there that we can sample that we believe that are, that are truly primordial, and that is um, asteroids. And, and we have pieces of asteroids on the Earth, and those are what we call meteorites. And so we have these rocks that we can study in the laboratory, and we can use the radioactive decay to, to determine their, their ages. And it's remarkable. If you look at uh, uh, over a dozen different radioactive decay, parent to alter decay uh, uh, pairs, you find that the, the date you get is, is remarkably consistent to better than a percent. It's 4.56, in fact, you could probably go to one more digit, billion years old. We believe that the asteroids are, and some other things like the, the asteroid belt, the, the Kuiper belt, comets, all of that is stuff that we call debris that's left over from the formation of the solar system. And when we date the debris that we have, the asteroids, 4.56 billion years. Is there something older than that out there? Well, we haven't found it yet, but that seems to be a very reasonably good date for how old the solar system is. The sun formed a little before that, the Earth formed just a little bit after that, and the giant planets may be a little bit after the Earth planets, but that's still a little bit debatable. No, no, no. My question was that one that you said about 8 billion. I'm aware of, the, of our own planets. Oh, that's based upon the age of the star. How do you get the age of a star? Uh, oh, distance. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just pulling a blank on me. Sorry. You, you lost me. You know ages of stars because of distance. So you're taking the age of the planet related to the star. I understand that now. Thank um, you. The, the, there are a couple of things there. We, we don't know the age of the star from its distance. We, we get the distance um, through a variety of other things like parallax, for instance. Uh, but a star that's 8 billion years old, say, could be 100 light years away. So they're, they're, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, they're, they're different things. The way we get the, the, um, the age of a star is by looking at models of stellar evolution. That is how they evolve over time by converting hydrogen into helium. And so they follow a very consistent path uh, of evolution um, for main sequence stars, you know, normal type stars, and they get hotter as time goes on, they get brighter as time goes on, in a way that we can date those stars. When I talked about a planet that's 8 billion years old, I was, I mean, that's the age of the star that it orbits. There's uncertainty to that age, but, um, and so we don't know it precisely, but, but the age is based upon the age of the star. Did I get did I understand you correctly? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I had one here. Okay, so re regarding the numbers that you, you, you put up on the screen, uh, there, were, uh, there are approximately one followed by 28 zeros atoms in a typical human body. That's 10,000 times the largest number you had on, on the screen. Is there any comment? about the scale of our life being in the middle of that number scale. Interesting. <clears throat> um, I don't know what to make of it. I, I mean, you, you, there's, there's a lot of interest in, in um, the anthropic principle where you look at you know, the characteristics of our universe and how that relates to, to life. What does it mean that you know, that we are, for instance, about midway in size between the size of a subatomic particle and the size of a supercluster. I don't know what that means. Um, I just don't know. I don't know how to, to answer a question. Um, it's a good question. Don't get me wrong. Is it a coincidence? I don't think that it is. But I, I just don't, I don't know how to answer it. Paul, did you, did you, uh, Paul Julian, did you have a, a follow up question to that? We're going to have to have you unmute yourself. 
yeah, I was trying to say, I was trying to think about how in the world would you think about that? It was kind of in the middle scale between enormously large things and like yeah. the cosmos with its vast scale of stars versus the scale of the human. It's yeah. one of the interesting ironies or, or scientific facts that we have that I think is utterly remarkable is that all the carbon and heavier elements of these atoms had, you had to have a large universe with uh, uh, stars forming, living, dying, and making supernovae that made the carbon and the heavier elements and expel them into the universe in order for us to have carbon-based life or any other kind of life at all. So yeah. the universe has to be old and large in order for us to be here as living beings. So it's just that everything kind of hangs together when you look at both uh, particle physics, subatomic physics, and cosmology, and there's just this unity of physics that's beautiful. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. There's probably that could stimulate a lot of reflection, but. But I don't, I, I don't know how to answer a question. What does it mean? I, I agree like you. It, it probably has to be that way for us to be here asking the question about why it's that way. That's probably a good way to put it. All right. Uh, another question here, and this is uh, kind of going to go off on a tangent that you didn't cover in your talk. How did these discoveries that uh, you, know, you and your, your colleagues have made and the searches for potential life and habitability impact your own theological speculations and questions? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that there's any way it hasn't impacted my, my belief in a, in a creator uh, or my, my theological perspective. Um, I mean, even, even just looking at the, you know, at theology itself, if you take theology as the, the, um, the study of the relationship between God and man, well, man is tied into his environment. As, as we just talked about earlier, we can't exist without this universe around us. We can't exist apart from this world around us. So if we're studying the relationship between the earth, uh, between God and man, it's related to this relationship between God and the rest of the universe. It's related to our relationship with all of it. So when we study, you know, everything around us, all the things that, that we've discovered, they, they give us a picture of a very complex creation, which maybe it, that's what's necessary for us to be here. I don't know, but I see um, a theological import in everything that we discover. And it's, it's in a way, it's again, it's kind of hard to articulate, but if, if you, you know, a few minutes ago, I was saying that we're always surprised at what we discover. Um, different degrees of surprise, sometimes slightly surprised, sometimes we're flabbergasted. But every time we're surprised, we see a universe that's much bigger, much more complex, much more intricate than what we expected. And to me, that means that the creator is always much bigger, <laughs> much more complex, is much more of a genius than what I expected. The way I like to think of it is that whenever we make a new discovery, that just shows me that there's a bigger God, a bigger creator. And, and, and that's pretty much the way I, I look at everything, whether it's a glass of water, when we're learning about how water behaves at high pressure and temperature, or whether we're talking about a sunset on Pluto, or um, you know, a, a planet around a, a distant pulsar. You know, we're always surprised at what we find. I mean, the laws of physics, you can write them down, like I said, on a, on a napkin. And the conservation laws, and then you get matter and energy, and you throw it all together, and voila. You know, of course, it's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being funny there. It's not like that, but it is like that in a way. And how did that get crafted? I think is a theological question. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm helping or hurting um, what I'm trying to say, but the question that, you, that was asked was how, does, how did the discoveries impact my, my say, theology? 
I think it always gives me a sense of a bigger God whenever we discover anything about the universe that's new. It's almost like, it's almost like God enjoys surprising us. Does that make sense? I mean, I know in, in like my personal life and my belief in God since I was younger, you, you always have challenges and you pray for help or you pray for solutions or you pray for someone and things work out in ways sometimes you expect or hope and sometimes they don't. But you're always surprised, or at least I'm always surprised at how things t always end up working out. And it's the same way in a sense when we look at, at the universe. We're always surprised at how God has decided to do things, how he works things out. I know it's not a, a, you know, a logical or firm connection between those two, but it's the same sense of, of surprise that God is always bigger in how he chooses to do things than how you would expect him to do things. All right, Dr. Summers, uh, we're going to go to Mars. Okay, let's go to Mars. Let's go to Mars. Uh, why has it been so hard to detect life on Mars considering all of the probes we've sent there over the decades? Um, hmm. Actually, that's a, that's a good question. Um, Mars is, as you know, as I pointed out, it's a rather hostile environment, at least for, for life as we know it. So if it's there, it's probably underground. The surface is so oxidizing. There's sunlight, ultraviolet radiation that makes it to the surface. There's ozone that's in contact with the surface. There's hydrogen peroxide there. Any kind of organics would be destroyed very rapidly. Um, and it's only if you get underneath that will you be able to find complex organics, which the Curiosity rover did detect last year, found complex organics underneath the surface. The complex organic compounds, molecules, are present, and, and we haven't studied them. Uh, we've barely scratched the surface, no pun intended, at how much we've studied them, but they're there. But finding life is a little bit more difficult than finding complex organics. Um, and if it's there, it's probably going to be deeper. And so there's all sorts of chemical experiments that you could, you could carry out on the surface of Mars that involve the atmosphere and the soils, and you would never see, the, say, the byproducts of metabolic reactions because they're all oxidized. But if you went a few meters down, they could be ubiquitous. And so I think that ultimately that's the biggest problem we faced is that habitability on Mars is probably underground. The Viking lander had saw interesting chemistry, but it can be explained with non-biological things. But even if it couldn't, it would be hard to interpret the results because they're in the surface, this, this hostile environment. Looking at the atmosphere of Mars from the Earth, it's hard to, to look at... Um, at methane, for instance, and prove that there's life there. Even if it turns out that the methane is there, it evolves seasonally, just as life would evolve, then we still couldn't prove that it's life because it's in the atmosphere in a hostile environment. We have to look where life is, where there's a habitable region inside of Mars. Otherwise, the chemistry, the natural chemistry, has just modified things too much. All right, another question here. We'll just uh, do uh, two more. Uh, is there evidence that life would have the ability to travel on meteors and other interplanetary travelers? Yeah, that's a, go ahead. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's been talked about quite a lot because we have um, several. I guess it's close to two hundred now meteorites that have have uh, been identified as coming from Mars. In fact, I have a tiny little tenth of a gram piece of, uh, of Mars uh, from a meteorite that landed in Arizona that's on display at GMU. Tiny, tiny little piece, but it was from Mars. And we know these meteorites come from Mars because they have the, the same type of isotopic signature and noble gas signatures we find from the, the, the landers and the atmospheric pro, uh, atmospheric. Uh, studies that we've done of Mars. It's like a, 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 a thumbprint, that, that when we see that thumbprint, we know there's no other place in the solar system it could have come from but from Mars. And we also find 
other things like minerals and carbonates, you know, and, and um, um, uh, just chemicals that, that suggest that it came from Mars too. But um, it's, so it's important to figure out if indeed you could share life between planets, because we know that rocks are sent back and forth between planets. When you work out the numbers of how many rocks have come from Mars to Earth in Earth history, it's many, many millions of tons. And it's harder to go from the Earth to Mars, but nonetheless, you can do it. It's a lesser amount, but you can get large amounts of stuff transported to Mars. It could be that we are all Martians, for instance. Maybe life originated on Mars, transplanted to Earth, and then, you know, here we are. Or it could have been originated on the Earth, gone to Mars, wiped out on the Earth, and brought back to the Earth by meteorites. Again, all sorts of scenarios that we can't test right now. But what we can test is, can life survive in a meteorite as it makes this, you know, this travel between Mars and the Earth. And it turns out that in some cases, it's pretty obvious it can. If you have a big meteorite that's thick enough to shield the interior from, um, say, ultraviolet radiation, cosmic radiation, and suppose you have something like a tardigrade that you could freeze dry, um, although I suspect that a, a microbe would be a little bit of a better candidate, and then you reanimate it when it gets to, say, the Earth or Mars, I think something like that could happen. But the, the key is, what, is the, what does the, the, the meteorite experience during its travel from one planet to the other? Like the, the, um, the famous Martian meteorite that was um, in the 1990s was cl uh, claimed to show evidence of fossils of uh, life uh, uh, from its origin point on Mars, it was in space about 17 million years, okay? It's a long time. Can life live that long? We don't know. Um, there are some microbes that have been supposedly animated that are 60 million years old, reanimated, that have dried up in amber, you reanimate them, and they, you know, they reproduce and do like they, they did before. Um, but we don't, I, I guess what I'm saying, we don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. There's a lot of studies that going into looking at that right now, but it's, a, it's, a, it's got some questions dealing with what is the environment of the, the asteroid itself or the meteorite that comes from the asteroid. All right, last question for the evening. Uh, could the red clouds on Jupiter be caused by organisms? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to talk about um, life inside the atmosphere of Jupiter, but there's liquid water inside of Jupiter and plenty of um, uh, interesting chemical compounds and um, energy. Um, the short answer is we don't know again. We don't know the chemical formula of the compound that uh, produces any of the colors uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere at this point. Um, there's some indication that the reddish and the orangish colors come from sulfur and maybe potassium or phosphorus that was uh, knocked off of Io and that ended up uh, falling into Jupiter's atmosphere and then being oxidized, producing something we call a chromophore, which is a, a big construct, much bigger than a molecule, and can reflect light, you know, visible light, so that we see it as a, as a color. Um, uh, but we don't know the chemical form of it at this point. Could it be a chemical byproduct? Uh, I don't think we know enough to, to know whether that's, a, you know, whether the red coloring that we see is due to biology. We've still got to, to answer the prior question is what chemical formula is it or what, what formula or what, uh, what, uh, what are all the colors and how are they produced um, either internally or externally, you know, where do they come from? internally or externally. It's just, it's a hard, it turns out to be a remarkably hard question to answer. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Summers. Uh, Please call me Mike. We know each other from years, so call me Mike. So, um, uh, you know, appreciate your time tonight, and uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for uh, being available to, uh, to do this after your uh, March uh, talk was canceled.
Sure. No problem. Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. You're, you're welcome to stay uh, for the next uh, 25 minutes uh, to do a little networking with the crowd here. Uh, we've still got about 27 participants on the line. And I am going to go, I don't know if I can do this. I'm fairly new to this. I can't unmute everyone, but uh, I think everyone can unmute themselves. And, um, but before we, we get to the, the social networking part of this, I would like to close this evening in prayer. And I, I don't necessarily want to assume uh, that I, I'm going to do this, but if anyone out there uh, feels led to close us out in prayer, I certainly would invite you um, to do so. So I will give about uh, 15 seconds to see if anyone would want to volunteer for this. And if not, I will do the honors. All right. Let's bow our heads in prayer and, and meet the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you first and foremost for creating this vast cosmos. Uh, we are such a small part of it, yet you have condescended in the best possible way and met us, our small selves, right where we're at. And you see us and you incarnated yourself uh, to be with us and to love us and to interact with us as parts of your vast creation. And we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for the technology that you've allowed human beings to develop to interact in this way, in this fashion, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now. And Lord, we just ask your, your hand on the, the hands and the minds of all of the researchers and doctors who are working feverishly to find a, a solution to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and ways to, to mitigate uh, the effects of those who have it. And Lord, we pray your special hand on those who are suffering uh, with this disease, uh, that you would guide their doctors uh, to the best treatments possible. We also pray for those who have lost friends and loved ones uh, to this disease that you would meet them in their grief and that uh, you would cause your Holy Spirit to just be a comfort to them as they surround themselves um, with uh, as many family as safely possible, but also uh, that you would, you know, just prompt their friends and family to reach out to them over the internet, just to, just to you know, give them comfort and peace. Uh, Lord, we also thank you for Dr. Summers, uh, that you would bless his efforts as he goes forward uh, into this new school year at George Mason University, uh, and just give him the, the peace of mind that everything he's doing to educate our students in uh, the planetary sciences, uh, that it's exactly what uh, they need, and uh, we just ask uh, your special blessing on everyone here tonight uh, as they go forth uh, into their own workplaces and their homes uh, that uh, you would uh, just your spirit would prompt them to be disciple makers uh, first and foremost uh, to help conform us to the image of Jesus Christ and uh, secondly uh, to be uh, witnesses to our colleagues and classmates and family members and to bring them into the kingdom so that they can be as marvelously awed about their place in your vast creation. In Jesus' name we pray.